TwinCam is a channel about cars. Not any particular type of car, but cars generally. And that isn't one. The Sinclair C5 is one of the best known great industrial failures, tanking its computing giant of a designer and becoming a bit of a joke in the process. But nearly 40 years on, it remains in the national psyche for some reason. So today, let's figure out what goes into this and why it failed. Before we get into it though, this little thing is to be auctioned by Manor Park Classics. So if you fancy getting your hands on a bit of 80s goodness, then please do follow the link in the description. Any Brit over the age of 40 will remember Sir Clive Sinclair as one of the best known computing personalities of the 70s and 80s. Sinclair was responsible for the first ever pocket calculator and the very existence of the British gaming industry, offering the first mass-produced computer for under £100. They were so successful that in 1984, Sinclair Research held 45% of the UK personal computer market. But Sir Clive wasn't someone who followed a crowd. His success was born from innovation, so in 1983 he founded Sinclair Vehicles, and two years later we met the infamous C5. In his pomp, Clive Sinclair wasn't exactly a poor man, and the C5 wasn't merely a vanity project. In founding Sinclair Vehicles, he envisioned the jump-starting of the electric vehicle market with a full range of cars, including the C15, a four-seat family car. But that could wait, as through selling 10% of his shares in the computer company, Sir Clive raised 12.9 million quid that could be funneled into making another of his dreams come true. I say it was a dream because the man had been looking into transport solutions since the early 1970s. And I say that line because none of these things were anything approaching a car. But it was 1983 before it became viable. Here's where the motor industry comes in though, because the C5 only exists thanks to a very careful interpretation of the regulations. This is a tale as old as history as we've seen it many times before, most notably in Britain with Reliant. The Regal, Robin and Rialto all existed because of a quirk in British law that classified them as motor tricycles, not as proper cars, and that meant you could drive them around on a motorcycle license. A lot of people in Britain gained their independence in the 50s and 60s on bikes, and when the time came to get a family, they didn't have a car license, and so bought a Reliant instead. They were surprisingly expensive for what they were, but they provided transport and in an incredibly British niche in the market. We've seen that outside of Britain as well, most recently with the Citroen Ami, which is legally a motor quadricycle, and in France that means a 14-year-old can drive one on the roads. The electrically assisted pedal cycle regulations of 1983 allowed the use of electrically assisted bicycles without the licensing requirements of a motorcycle. And because of the way it was worded, it meant a 14 year old could drive one of these around with no tax, insurance, license or anything like that. Sir Clive Sinclair saw this tiny niche as a much bigger opportunity to, pro to provide mass transportation on a minuscule scale. And in the 1980s, let's be honest, emissions were not the central goal of this project. Instead, the central goal was in reducing congestion. If everybody had tiny little things like this, then there wouldn't be the need for so many cars in Britain's ever so crowded city centres. While a proper car was on the horizon, the C5 had to come first, partly because it was radical, and that was good for PR, but mainly because this little fella was pretty cheap to design and produce. We'll get towards how the C5 was actually built in a bit, but when it comes to the British motor industry in the early 1980s, where might there have been some dormant production facilities? Oh yeah, from one failure to another, may I introduce the DeLorean Motor Company. The vision was for Sinclair to take over the old DeLorean factory, then produce the C5 and C15 alongside each other. But Northern Ireland and the C15, of course, never happened. The latter didn't happen because 
well, bankruptcy. But as for DeLorean, the deal fell through, necessitating a new plan for C5 production. But while they were at it, Sinclair did snatch up one of DeLorean's jewels, a man named Barry Wills, the new managing director of Sinclair Vehicles. The C5 may look simple to us today, but it needed proper development from someone who knew what they were doing. So through his connections, Wills put Sinclair in touch with Lotus. That means that this microcar, tricycle, however you classify it, was developed at Hethel by Lotus engineers in just the same way one of their cars would have been. But don't think for one second that the scale of the project might have made things easy, as those regulations were tight, meaning the C5 had to weigh less than 60 kilograms. Before Lotus stepped in, the C5 silhouette had already been dreamt up by Tom Caron. Funnily enough, the same guy who did the Reliant Robin. It's all one nice big bubble, this story. But the problem at Ogle was that the C5 wound up being far too heavy, so Lotus, as you'd expect, had to simplify and add lightness. In the end, the Sinclair was a very clever piece of engineering, with a simple and slightly flexible chassis, an injection moulded body and a 200 watt electric motor powering the near side rear wheel. It was everything Sir Clive had hoped it to be, having little hesitation in proclaiming it to be the future of personal city transport. So what's actually wrong with just pedalling this thing around and using the electric assist? Well, for starters, and this one's an example of that, the electric system wasn't very good. You see, it only has a standard lead acid battery, 12 volt thing, the kind of one you'd expect in a normal passenger car. And that meant it didn't last very long. So for most of the time, you would end up pedaling it around like I am. Second of all is kind of the general build quality of the thing because, you know, this is built by Hoover, who at the time were making some very, very high quality vacuum cleaners. But if I come back up to the camera here, and hopefully the brakes work, they do on one axle. That's not a quality product. That's really not a quality product. And also, the turning circle is like one on a bus. You could get cars that are more manoeuvrable than this in a tight space relative to its size. Disastrous. Now it is hilarious fun pedaling this thing around and it's actually quite comfortable as well. I mean, I'm not particularly tall and I wouldn't want to be very tall in this thing, uh, but for someone of my height, it's perfectly usable. And the handlebars below you feel like they're always meant to be there. I'm enjoying this thing. It's fun, but that's the problem. It's fun and it's only fun. This feels like something you'd buy a child to mess around with, not as a transport solution. I'm not particularly the best person to be talking about. I don't ride bikes, certainly not, but um, I'm already a little bit tired out from pedaling this thing around here. And you kind of had to do that because the electric system was pretty rubbish. I don't see the benefit of this over a bike. It gets worse though, because not only does this thing feel like a toy, but it rather is one as well, because I'm sat here in between two vaguely contemporary cars, especially this Mark IV Ford Escort. It's an XR3i, which is very cool, but that's not the point. Look at the height I am. Now, people go on the internet about how you could be knocked down by lorries and stuff like that. And yes, that is a potential issue, but it's only the same as if you were a cyclist. So it's not the end of the world. It's just something to bear in mind and drive around, just be careful with. Sinclair would also sell you a flagpole for the back, which I can't imagine inspired much confidence, but it was there if you really wanted it. The problem for me is the height. On a bicycle, you're relatively high up. You're higher up than you would be in most cars. But in this thing, you're really down low. And if you're trying to commute through quite a heavily congested city, then you're pretty much at exhaust height. 
And this is the mid 1980s when, as I said, emissions really didn't matter. No cars had catalytic converters in the UK, or very few anyway. Next to nothing had fuel injection as well. And the emissions regulations on the MOT were, well, if it doesn't smoke, then it must be fine. So I can't imagine it would be very pleasant actually driving this thing around right in the face of some kind of, I don't know, Morris et al with blown piston rings. Final thing as well, it's not the lightest of things in the world. That's why it's a bit more tiring than I imagined it to be, rather than just being able to get on it and go anywhere like you could on a bicycle, for example. There's a little bit more force involved with getting this thing going because it's a lot heavier than a bicycle. You see, barring consulting a group of families on its handlebar placement, Sinclair did no customer testing with the C5. It was the brainchild of an inventor famous for creating markets, and in this case, he rather got ahead of himself. But no matter, as money is what does the talking, and despite concern from some of the companies involved, it was the will of Sir Clive Sinclair to see the project through. And with the failure of the DeLorean deal, he had to find someone to produce the C5. Producing it in-house was never on the table, not just because of the costs involved, but because Sinclair Vehicles was a different company to Sinclair Research, and expenditure had to be kept to a minimum with the gamble they were taking. So as we did before, who in Britain has experience with plastic bodies and electric motors? In the 1980s, it was Hoover. Back when they were still an industry leader, Hoover produced their appliances near Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales, and with a mere £100,000, the plant was kitted out to produce C5s. The aftercare was sorted too, with Hoover's service network contracted to look after them. The 10th of January 1985 was the big day. The launch of the C5 and the 3 million quid ad campaign made them look like a huge player, and as if a revolution really was going to happen. They managed to shift 5,000 of the things in the first month, and if that trajectory would have continued, Sinclair vehicles would have made it work. It seems they'd thought of everything. The production, the infrastructure, advertising, and public awareness were all boxed off and destined for the stars. But then people drove one. As I mentioned earlier, the inherent problem with the C5 was that it didn't solve any problems. You got the downsides of a car with the downsides of a bike. And with a battery and motor so feeble it couldn't climb hills, it was useless to the general public. Add to that the lack of any gears, and when the motor did stop running, it was difficult to pedal. Those who did buy the C5 were your typical early adopters, as when faced with a £400 price tag, the general public were just not interested. However, the C5 was only one of Sinclair's problems. You see, his computers may have been stratospherically successful, but they existed in something of a bubble. Sinclair didn't follow demand, it created it. And though that meant something as left of field as the C5 was to be expected, it wasn't solid ground on which to build a business. And 1984, the year before we met the C5, was the year the cracks started to show. Sinclair ended up in a price war that didn't do its image any favours, and come Christmas time, the computer bubble had burst. Not only was Sinclair Research now struggling, but Sir Clive was faced with an array of blunders. First, the TV80, which was beaten to market by the Sony Watchman, and secondly, the QL, an attempt at a professional personal computer to rival IBM and Apple. The QL and C5, though created by technically independent companies, were both simply poor products, and with Sir Clive's image so deeply rooted in his products, investors began to run away. The attention the C5 received wasn't just because it was curious, but because Sinclair was one of Britain's great success stories at a time of recession and following a decade of strife. If it was created by someone else, it would probably have been forgotten. But with no market and a shed load of money behind it, Sinclair Vehicles was visibly splitting at the seams. 
There were 4,500 units they couldn't get rid of, and the retailer Comet began offering them for only £140. And we all know where this leads. By August 85, the writing was on the wall as Hoover stopped production of the C5s because they weren't being paid by Sinclair. On the 4th of November 1985, Sinclair Vehicles was liquidated, and in the April of the following year, Sir Clive sold the bulk of his business, and that was the end of the story. It had taken three years to go from market supremacy in computers to laughing stock and total financial failure. We've seen some proper British disaster stories when it comes to motoring on this channel, but none of them have almost single-handedly bankrupted their company in the way the C5 did. So despite this not being a car as such, it fits very well into a very twin cam kind of narrative. And with that, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to twin cam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description and I'll have more videos coming along soon.